my name is Vic Chapman and I'm talking to uh, Jessica Belger about uh, her educational journey, a journey that I made some 68 years ago, that I started 68 years ago. Good to see you, Jessie. Again, it's good to be here today, and more importantly, it's good that you're here. Um, your involvement and contribution to this uh, new uh, uh, learning and teaching program, um, Indigenous Learning Ecologies, today and uh, next Friday. We'll highlight the importance of Indigenous educators and uh, it will inform uh, those involved in teacher preparation of the difficulties and the problems and the concerns that Indigenous students have and uh, um, what teachers, the problems that teachers have in, in teaching Indigenous students. When I began that journey 68 years ago, there were no signposts and there were very few people willing to show the way uh, or wanted to. And going it alone was very scary. Feel just a little bit scary today, don't because you're among your own people. So, thank you again for coming in, for being involved in this program, and the, uh, the con contribution that will make to engaged uh, student, uh, student centred experiences. And now, on to the important part. Um, What moments have been significant to you in your educational journey and, and why? I think it's people. It's always been people. Um, I set out to do visual arts and education at uni from the limited perspective of going to a small country town high school and I had a bit of a knack for drawing. I liked, I'm happiest when I'm making something and I had a really, I had some really amazing teachers myself, particularly my art teacher. And I saw that the kids that had the things at school that I didn't, like the money for the excursions and the fancier bikes and all of that, their parents were teachers. So from that perspective, I thought, right, that's a way to have a, um, a stable career. And I ended up at COFA doing the Bachelor of Art Education because those two things went together. Um, so yeah, and, and it, the, one of those key moments is, is the people along the way that inspire you. Um, and certainly getting to COFA and having the support networks, having academics that um, that got it and that were willing to work with somebody that was from a really, um, or that was really frightened, I suppose. Um, who was the most Im important, influential person in your, uh, along the way? I, I can remember mine, uh, my very important, uh, influential person who um, at Goodinga Public School in 1944 who um, came people it, it was uh, coming into a place of like Goodinga itinerant workers very quickly adopted the attitudes of non-indigenous people towards indigenous people and uh, uh, and, the, and the enrolment of Goodoo Public School was possibly 90, 95% Aboriginal. But this person didn't uh, fit that mould and uh, he tested the water for himself and thought I had some academic promise. And that decision that was made to do a state bursary changed my life forever. And I suppose you would have pe people like that in your life. Yeah, I had um, I had the high school art teacher that she certainly played a role in giving me the confidence to feel like I could make that big step and do the degree in Sydney. But when I got here, um, it got a little bit more interesting because the all universities have the um, the Indigenous Support Unit, and UNSW has um, Nurigili. I didn't I didn't use the 
Indigenous Centre for most of my degree because I thought, I sort of thought, oh no, I, I can do it on my own. I don't want to be, you know, in that box and don't want to be sort of marked as a bit of a battler and need all that support. So um, I later sort of changed my opinion on how Indigenous support units can benefit. But when I was 19 and I first got here, I, that sort of didn't fit with me. So I was lucky enough to go along at COFA for a year or so and have um, good teachers. But then I met an Indigenous academic who um, had just happened to have been given a office in the same hallway. And what was particular about that relationship was she welcomed me into a community of, um, of just other Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people that had an interest in the arts, an interest in education. And it, you didn't have to go to a room and be in a box with computer rooms with free printing. It was just a, a community of good friends that, that shared interests. And, and that worked a lot a lot more for me than than um, than the particular set out place for it. Yeah. Now, uh, I was in a similar a similar situation. I think to you. In retrospect, I think doing it by yourself, not having an indigenous unit there, uh, put a, a lot of reliance on your on your own uh, on yourself. And I think that strengthened your backbone. That overcoming those difficulties. But I realise, as you say, the uh, the importance of Indigenous units, and uh, yeah, because the community aspect is important. So many yes. of our and it's not to say that all Indigenous students that come to university are the same, because they're certainly not. Some are from some have grown up in the city, some have grown up with wealthy parents, and some are at the opposite end of the scale. So it's not that they're all the same, and they have yes. they all um, have the same needs. But what the support units do is create a place where you can be part of that community yep. if you want to mm. and yeah. that I've had some really positive experiences uh, using them and also working for one. Mm -hmm. I think the, the real uh, really significant part of in, uh, those, those units, Indigenous units, are uh, uh, when Indigenous students uh, come to to study at the university. Um, they miss their family. Yeah, and uh, they um, that is something that determines how long they stay. The, the yeah. yeah, how how strongly they feel for their family, and uh, the Indigenous units give them that support. Well, that homesickness on its own homesickness is a big factor. It took me until week seven of semester one to actually stay in Sydney. Every other Friday afternoon yeah. I was in the car and yeah. four hours yeah. down the Hume Highway and yeah. home because yeah. it was all a little bit too scary. Yeah. But it took until yeah. week seven to actually yeah. spend the weekend at the yeah. uni accommodation. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I, when I first took off on my educational journey from Goodoover, the most boring place in Australia, was favourite to Dubbo High, which at the time was the nearest full high school in Queensland, New South Wales border. Mm. And I'm a, at every available opportunity, I made that journey home from Dubbo mm -hmm. to Goodoga, even if it meant just some, uh, sometimes spending 12 hours at home, mm -hmm. just getting off the mail truck, spending a little bit of time at home, getting back on the mail truck and going away. Mm -hmm. So, um, Homesickness is, is a, a real problem, isn't it? Um, how important is it being uh, connected to people and community? Uh, um, I, I find if I don't go home for a couple of months, I start to not be feeling right. I think yeah. every time I go home, it sort of recharges the batteries. You get to see who's proud of you, you get to see what, particularly when I was studying and finding it hard that um, having having people at home that were sort of that were gunning for you to do something big and make a difference and, and do something yeah. that just have choices that's all it is it's not yeah. that I've changed the world it's just that I had the ability to go gee where's what will I do you know now I've got all of these options because I um, busted my butt and got the ATAR that gave me the options so yeah. it, it, it that was um, it, it's always good to, to go home and it recharges me to um, just to have that little bit of extra encouragement. Uh, community here is important as well. Yeah. Um, and I've, I mean, it's only the last couple of years I've gotten a bit of a community in Sydney with um, cousins who have come to study after I did and mm. uh, other young friends who are in similar fields. And we've got a bit of a feeling of community here now. So 
that, and that's taken me years yeah. to develop. Yeah. yeah. I think um, at home, the, the backers at home and in your community are very, very important, uh, as you say, because uh, I don't think I would have ever completed the course if it wasn't for the expectations of those people at home. Mm -hmm. I dare not let them down. Mm -hmm. And and what about the community in which work? Um, how important is it to connect to uh, people in that community? As in the community I work with now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm in Sydney. I've been living in Sydney um, for most of the time since I graduated in 2008. At the moment I work for a non-profit called Career Trackers and what we do is mm. we work with Indigenous university students to create internship opportunities in the private sector. Mm. So one of the big um, principles that I try and see through with my work at the moment is that our second year students and our third year students, we have all of these sort of funny networking events where we teach them sort of little tricks about being in the corporate world and one of the um, and we were always making sure that students are spending time with one another and so that they can see well hang on that guy's a, a 12 months ahead of me and and they don't seem that you know that much clever or that much more brilliant than me so maybe I can get there that the community between um, between the students that I work with at the moment is um, I make sure I, I push for that with all of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why did you choose to go into art education? Um, I just, yeah, I put two things, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I wanted to teach uh, because I could see that there are a lot of people around me that didn't further their education. So, you know, parents and aunts and uncles, some of my aunts and uncles did, um, at, but a lot of community, a lot of Indigenous people from where I grew up, they, they didn't have many options and they, they didn't see university as a, they didn't get that opportunity to, to do those extra steps. So I thought, well, I've got the chance to do that. Um, and teaching is a really, or education is a really stable start to doing something with your life. And I'm just, I, I can't seem to, even though at the moment I don't really have um, visual arts in my actual job, what I'm doing at the moment, I've never gotten away from it. I'm always, it's always been important to me because it's a whole other way to understand the world and it's a way to connect with other people that you, I don't think you can do in any other way. So I think um, at, at, toward the end of high school it made a lot of sense to me to put those two together and, and do, the, do the Bachelor of Art Education here. Yes. Um, why is it valuable to have in, uh, Aboriginal art teachers uh, within our education system? Well, it's incredibly important because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of opportunity to teach Aboriginal art in the curriculum, and I think that in the past there's been a bit of a disjointed um, way of doing it, and we've all we're all familiar with the Clifford Possum at Emu footprint handout and you know make a story based on these prints and let's study the artists that are from uh, Western Australia or the Northern Territory but what I found in my couple of years of teaching in high schools is that kids are much more open to learning about Aboriginal art if you take the process and teach that to them so rather than saying here's a key like a legend to a map and now we're going to get you to tell a story in the same way this artist who's obviously like that's those are his symbols from his culture it's not going to make sense to um, to every student so I had a little bit of success with getting students to understand the the process so that that the the Aboriginal artwork that we are looking at is about a particular experience or a trip from here to there or it's about the land from the top down and you know using that visual language using the same principles that the Aboriginal artist is using uh, and creating an artwork that's about your own experience and your view of the world rather than just using it like a key or a legend. So I think uh, being an Indigenous art teacher is important because, or having more of them is, be is important because you've got to have that, um, oh, I can't think of the word, you've got to have the the um, 
to actually go, no, hang on, this is how it should be. This is how it should be done. We don't need the Clifford Possum handout. Um, just the, the, um, I want to say the balls to do it, but the, um, <laughs> yeah, just the, the, oh, it'll come to me later. But, um, the, there's a spillover uh, from, uh, um, from, from Aboriginal students to non-Aboriginal students, is there? In the teaching of Aboriginal art. Sorry, say that again. Uh, there's a spillover. It, it, it affects the teaching of uh, the Aboriginal art teacher is uh, has a, a great effect on non-Indigenous people as well as Indigenous people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not only as a uh, as somebody that they can that they can. Um, um, what's the word? And identify with, but uh, um, yeah, I always, it's it's <laughs> funny. I always find it interesting because students get this weird um, when you take the mystery away from it. When you because uh, there's the, all this taboo around wow, it's dots, and and when you can actually have a conversation about what the artist is trying to do, what the meaning is behind it, it demystifies it for non-Indigenous students that were expecting it to be part of this, I don't know, taboo sort of thing that they weren't ever going to get access to knowing about. Oh. Uh, what uh, key issues have been most uh, important and relevant to you uh, as an alumni of CAFA? COFA is definitely known in the world of art teachers. I don't think I, I've taught in a few different schools, a lot of casual and temporary things, and everywhere you go, oh, you're from COFA. So it's and a lot of the um, a lot of the positions in the really good schools around Sydney, they're, they're COFA grads. So it's definitely a place that's got a, a really um, a, a, got a good reputation behind it. Um, mm. Issues, though, I don't. I'm struggling for something to say about issues. Um, um, what is important about visual arts in your learning and the learning of others? And would you give an example of how visual arts has enriched your journey and how it might enrich the journey of others? Having um, something to do with the, having, being involved with visual arts has given me a lot of really amazing experiences, lots of trips and being part of lots of workshops with artists. But what I, um, what I find most interesting is when you can get somebody who's not part of the art world to get it, and that's really cool. So I've got a younger cousin who was doing his year 12 area of study and the, the topic was belonging. And he had to have an additional text, and like something that he knew about to write about in his exam. And uh, it's always the same. And the markers get sick of it because it's the same thing, that students use the same extra material every time. But I thought I might try and shake him up and do something a little bit different. So he was in Sydney on a trip and I took him to the Art Gallery of New South Wales to see Lynn Onus's Fruit Bats. And we had a really big conversation about belonging to uh, in, uh, belonging to Indigenous culture, but also having uh, a connection to his non-Indigenous heritage. And um, and we had a lot of conversation around that. And that was one moment where I can go he, for my younger cousin the exposure to an artwork and what you can understand through engaging with artwork is what made him get a get a concept in a more sophisticated way than all of the texts he's read in, he'd read in his English class was going to allow him to do. So I think that's um, that's one of my nice sort of moments where I've gone, yes, having the capacity to engage with art and use it as a, as a learning tool um, is definitely a life choice that I'm really pleased that I went down. Yeah. Okay. Would you give an example of the, of the systems that you have come up against in your journey and uh, how you have negotiated to move forward? Systems. Systems. What do we mean by systems? 
yeah, I don't think I have anything worthwhile to say about that. I I found that uh, now working when I, when I was working, um, I came across lots of situations where um, people were really not very well informed about Aboriginal people, and. Uh, Seeing somebody in the in the teaching so in that in a in a role in in the teaching uh, was very strange to them. Um, and I don't think they, a lot of people couldn't uh, uh, handle the fact that you know, he was somebody who was uh, who was an indigenous person. Um, and uh, he's in authority over me. Um, and there were lots of occasions also where um, it was a, a, an Indigenous person in, in, in a school situation was better than having terms of, of paper or, 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 or a document. Um, of course, uh, and there were instances when uh, staff came, uh, made statements, and I could say, well, that's not actually accurate. Um, and the good thing about uh, many of those situations uh, was the, the thanks for uh, a bit of correct, uh, correction bit of corrective history. Uh, so that's what I, I, I really relish that particular aspect of, of teaching, where you could uh, correct a history that uh, lots of people had been, uh, lots of people in the system had been used to. Yeah. Um, and also, now when, when the, when the um, Aboriginal Studies and Aboriginal um, Education document came, in, came into force, I think there were lots of teachers who were willing to, uh, who were wanting to implement that, that policy, but didn't know how to proceed. And the other um, impediment was that uh, Indigenous communities because of the experiences, uh, negative experiences in the system, uh, were unwilling to participate. I think that'll be difficult for a long time for even well-meaning teachers yeah. to interpret yeah. how to teach, how, how to involve Indigenous content across their curriculums, even the ones that just mean, mean so well because it's we're still a long way away from a good understanding that Aboriginal people in Australia are all very different to one another. There's not, uh, there's not a simple, and we all, we both know that there's not a. I think that's still that's going to be a barrier for teachers for a while yet. Yeah. Yes. Because there's not an easy way to deliver the deliver a curriculum about Aboriginal Australia because you've got to accommodate for different different customs, different ways of doing things, yeah. different beliefs across different yeah. Aboriginal nations. Yeah. Um, I've just lost my train of thought there again. I scanned it. Um, would you? Uh, how has your view of who and what is important in becoming a professional person changed over time? Becoming a Becoming a professional person changed over time. How how is your view of who and what is important? Well, and at nineteen, I thought that I would finish my degree, be a visual arts teacher, teach in a school that I really liked for thirty five years, and that I really thought that there was one straight line like that. But I've done a whole bunch of different things, and um, I may and I'm I'm happy with what I'm doing now. But I'm pleased that I've tried a few different things. So. 
and I, when I went to write the bio for this, I sat down and I realised in five years I've worked for three different Australian universities, <laughs> TAFE also, I've had academic roles and general roles. Now I've left school and university altogether and I work for a private non-profit organisation. And throughout all of that, um, my opinions changed quite a lot because I've had the, I don't know, the, to the determination, I suppose, to keep trying different things when I didn't quite fit into what I'd let, where I'd landed. And along the way, I've realised that all I need to keep constant are my values and where I do that is, is irrelevant. Where I do what I'm good at is irrelevant. Uh, so whether I'm doing that, whether I'm teaching in a classroom and, and I miss that, like I, that's the, it's a, the rewarding feeling of being in a classroom is, is lovely. And I get a taste of that in what I'm doing now because I facilitate workshops with university students, so I get that. But um, I find that what I've been doing all along is, it's in this space of capacity building. So I'm working with Indigenous students that um, have got all the heart and intelligence to go somewhere, but they just don't know how to get there. So. I think that's, um, and whether that's got anything to do with um, with visual arts or or not, I find that um, that that's what I'm really good at. So across that journey, I've I've changed my opinion of what of where I should end up quite a bit. Do you think the schools in general um, and um, and uh, have and communities, Aboriginal communities? Uh, are better handling that that position that they that was held previously. Uh, people didn't know how to proceed, and people unwilling to be involved in in the school situation. Is that gap closing? The gap between community involvement in schools. Yeah, yeah. You uh, see between school understanding of Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal communities understanding of schools, I suppose. You see more and more success in that area, definitely. The school in my home community where my mum works as the Indigenous, um, the Aboriginal liaison uh, person, she's definitely had some success with, with getting parents on board with different understandings and she's, she's got a lot of, um, she's worked with a lot of non-Indigenous teachers at school that are really well-meaning and so there's there's some some success there and you see it, you see it everywhere you see some success but it, it, these things are going to take a few generations yet I think. Yeah. Um, I remember when I it was known that I was going to become a teacher one of the uh, uh, the uh, matrons of the local um, I suppose, what, what would you call it, uh, uh, the squatocracy, said, uh, of course he won't, he will only teach black kids. Um, you think there's, a, a, there's any vestige of that remaining, that sort of thing remaining? Uh, at present time. What do you mean with no. in, in Indigenous educators? Yeah. Well, in, as far as Indigenous, educa in, indigenous education, uh, Indigenous educators' involvement in schools are concerned. As in only working with Aboriginal students? Uh, well, I think that's more, that what that lady said was more or less uh, um, uh, a statement about how we could uh, fill those roles. Um, is there an ex a greater uh, acceptance of, uh, a great acceptance of uh, Indigenous teachers in school settings? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, it's, it's different with me though because um, I don't, a lot of the time um, I don't get the sort of full frontal judgement because yeah. I don't, I'm yeah. a bit lighter skin so I don't, yeah, it's um, but you hear that in the background, though. You can, uh, I think, even when you make that statement that no, I'm an Indigenous person. Oh, sure. Every time I say that, people go, "But why don't you have a broad?" I mean, their, their faces yeah. do it. Why don't you have a broad nose? And you know, it, it, you get a little bit of that. But um, it's also interesting as well because you get to use it as a little bit of a 
social experiment. So people will say all sorts of things that they would have rather they would have otherwise censored if um, if they realise that you're Aboriginal. So that gives me a good opportunity to hear the things that that you wouldn't necessarily say to some to, to somebody that was obviously Aboriginal, and it gets me a good opportunity to put my foot down and do some um, perspective correcting. But you get those instances when you say that, well, I'm one of those, yeah. and they and the re response is, but oh, but you're different. Yeah, yeah, you're not one of the <laughs> one of the criminals or the yeah. Um, What changes have you seen or uh, experienced for Indigenous Australians in uh, relation to education? Um, well, there's, there, there's more opportunity. Um, even in the five years that I've been out of university, there's uh, the level of support and the level of, um, I don't know, there are so many more uh, programs and things that young Indigenous students can do that didn't, that weren't even around when I finished high school. Um, so it, it, it change, it, it's changing for the better quickly, I think, but it's all dependent on which government we have and it's it goes up and down. It's <laughs> so there's more more opportunity and there's and, and there's greater support for uh, Indigenous students who uh, you know, who want to make the grade, uh, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are not. A lot of Indigenous students are not taking up are taking advantage of that. When you go to places like Walgett and Brewarrina and uh, um, it's rather sad um, to see um, the, the indolence. Uh, kids roaming the streets when they should be going to school. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there are offers of, uh, uh, of, of schools in Sydney who are willing to take those kids and have taken those kids from those outback towns um, you know, to give them the same opportunities as non-Indigenous kids, and when those kids, uh, those Indigenous kids, go back home, they don't want to. They don't want to go back there. Again. Yeah, how you break that cycle, break and how on earth we do something to convince the students that are part of that cycle that there's some value with leaving home and studying and that sort of yeah. thing. That's that's a big ask. That's a big ask. I think it's def. I mean, I don't come from a very remote place, but I think it's definitely ha the having a, a sense of community wherever you went, wherever you then go, and that doesn't have to be like I said before. It doesn't have to be all the indigenous kids in this one room and you know look after one another. Yeah. It's just about m making 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 friends that um, yeah. that share interests and creating an, a little network of your own. So, uh, what is the best way? to assist Indigenous and non-Indigenous students to achieve what, uh, as you have done at, at uni? Um. By example, there's no easy answer. They just have to see that other people can do it. There's no, there's no sort of model for a program. There's no easy answer about that. It's, it's just, um, I mean, good support, sure, but not paternal support as well. Yep. Um, and you see education as contributing to participation by Aboriginal people in, in the running of this place, in the running of Australia. I think it's, personally I think it's, it's essential that we be part of the running of this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um it's definitely important to, for a foundation, whether you then go on and do something else with, do, do, regardless of what you study, it's a foundation to get a qualification for sure. Yeah. I think it's important to see uh, Aboriginal faces as checkout chicks <laughs> uh, in banking, uh, uh, in education, as doctors, 
Now, if you go to places like um, Trangy, the uh, pharmacist there is an indigenous person. Um, one of their, the best surveyors in Wollongong was my son. Um, and I think it's important that we be seen in all those roles. So uh, education is the way, don't you think? Yes. Out of the big hole into which we've uh, fallen or been pushed. Yes. Would you say that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now how can we get more Indigenous students uh, to participate in, in education, in higher forms of education? The earlier the, the student realises it's a helpful idea, I think is important. Uh, with high school students and then that inspiration to come to university, it's so much about working out where you want to go. So it, it, trying to work with students to, to just to work out what it is they want to be uh, and then you tailor whatever study it is to that because just selling this idea of, oh, go to university, get a degree, get a good job, that's not enough anymore. It's got to be a path that suits you and university just happens to be part of it. Um, it's not as simple anymore as, you know, go to university, become a policeman, or go to university, become a teacher. It's not just this degree equals this job. It's not that straightforward anymore. So I think what's imperative with young people is that we, that whatever we're doing in schools, and even at uni when we're working out which path to take at uni, um, it has to be about the end goal, where it is you want to be, and then tailoring the pathway rather than just, um, choosing a degree and thinking you're done because that doesn't work out. Um, how do we overcome this, I suppose, what, can control, what we can call unconcern of uh, parents uh, in, say, outback place, places, like the ones that I mentioned before, Walcott and Bawarin and Gadoog and you mean like not inspired to get kids along to school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard to find. It's hard to work out how it's relevant. I mean, I don't have much experience. I, I've been to one place in the serious serious outback and on a Kofa trip to Papunya and did a couple of weeks in the high school as a or the school. It was a like a, a K to um, nine I th or ten I think, and then you'd have to go off further, but. Um, did a couple of weeks as a prac teacher in Papunya School on a trip with Art Education and um, School of Art at Kofa. And the, the school had about 90 students enrolled in the school, but on any one day, around 50 would come. And that's because there's, it's because of the area. So if, there, if my uncle's an artist in a neighbouring community and he's made a sale and there's money to to thrive over there, then that part of the family is going to travel and school becomes really unimportant. So it's, um, it's, different, it's definitely so different in remote areas to rural areas to metro areas, but there, there's definitely a level of, of um, parents that just haven't come, alo come along to, I don't know, to push it as a good idea because it's not, it can sometimes be just not that relevant. I think it's, uh, personally, I think uh, super teachers, I suppose, uh, are the answer. Are the answer. Uh, people like McKinnon, Mr. McKinnon, who uh, whom I came across in 1944, uh, who made a difference in my life, and he just had something that meant something to me, and. Uh, uh, I suppose I could see the relevance of, of education because my mum and dad couldn't read or write. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, that's a big part of it as well because I went to school with so many other students and it, I, it's not necessarily a race thing, it's just a, um, 
there, there were other students that were non-Indigenous that were struggling as well. Yeah. It's not that it was just the just a race thing, but at school, other students. The a perfect example is my husband, whose mother's a um, who edited for Lonely Planet, and what he used to do in his spare time was get call numbers and find library books in uh, like just as fun. So knew how to use university libraries as a young kid. It's that it's that exposure to knowing how the system works. It's having tertiary educated parents that can do all the complicated math stuff that used to make my mum cry in year nine when she'd had had to tap out at that point, you know? So it's it's definitely um, having uh, having all that well the techn the term is cultural capital, having that that um, already having an idea of how to cope in the situation. But that, that has changed uh, uh, in recent times. How to navigate the system is uh, uh, people are better able to navigate the system in, in uh, recent times. Now it's all out there in big, big letters. Um, I think the road is, the signs on the road are, are pretty plain to see. But people are still um, hesitating to go down that road.